I won and whew, hot, 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 hot. Eh, as if the isolation wasn't bad enough, now we're in a bit of a heat wave in the middle of the UK and the last couple of days have been scorching. And, practic and with hair like this, I'm I've got no like way to let any heat out. It's just like, uh, all over. Hopefully it'll cool down a bit soon, but yeah, I don't deal with the hottest of weathers too well. But we got four more games to go and that is shelf 32. So we are more than halfway done. I mean, after this, we've got four more columns and what's on top and then that's it. Still gonna take a while though, and glad you've been keeping up with the daily content, because, well, I've been able to put it out and you've been enjoying it, so why not? So this is a bit of a different shelf, this one, actually, as you can see. Uh, for the most part, it's dealt with by horrible games, and this is definitely gonna be a different style of game than you've probably been seeing throughout, you know, for a fair while, but there's also one game in there which is probably one of my biggest exceptions to the rule. And why don't we kick start with it first? Pulsar 2849. Now I'm going to be a little bit careful with the uh, box on this one, but Pulsar 2849, Czech Game Editions. This is the only game I've got from Czech Game Editions. I like Through the Ages, I just much prefer it on the app. But this one, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, Vladimir Suchi, the dry Euro game designer, and Pulsar 2849? What's this doing in your collection? I, to be honest, it confuses me to this day. It's a very dry point salad. It's set in space and you're supposedly building these gyroscope things and you're flying around space and looking at planets, but it is essentially a dry mechanical point salad. But the reason this gets me, and it is solely I think because of this, it's just because the variety of options you have in the game with Pass to Victory and that is just so plentiful. And being a point salad, it's rewarding every turn. You do something, you get points. Yeah, you may only get three as opposed to eight, but you're getting something. It doesn't feel like you're losing out. And the mechanics of this are pretty interesting. I mean, you have got a ton of technologies that are different every game that can give you other opportunities or powers. You've got different goals each game. You could go for the gyro things. You could just fly around space. You could investigate planets. You could build transmitters. There's all sorts of different ways that you can play to score points and you can focus and diversify as much as you feel like. But I love the dice mechanic here. You're rolling dice and you know, you're drafting them from this selection. But depending on where like the middle of those symbols are, like you know, it might be you've got a bunch of low, you've got a bar high, so kind of in the middle. Depending where you draft the dice from, levels you up and down on these two other tracks, which are both very important, but you have to pay the price to take the higher cost, um, the higher value dice as opposed to the lower value dice. And even when you've got those dice, you use them to perform actions and you must have the exact number. None of this whole, oh, there's at least three or more I can do this. No, no, no. It's like, what's pictured there? That's the number you need. Nice and clear, perfect graphic design. But it just, it's very smooth. It doesn't take too long. I mean, you're talking two hours absolute tops. And even then, you should be able to get it done in 90 minutes with three or less players who know what they're doing. And it just, I don't know, smooth, rewarding point salad. It's not that complicated to explain, you know, everything's fairly, you know, self-explanatory in a few places. And it just seems to have really shot up my charts as one of the biggest exceptions to the rule I have, where, you know, a game that I probably shouldn't like just ended up singing to me. Occasionally these come through, and I'm glad I gave this one a chance. Right, let's move on to horrible games. Let's start off with, this is a bit of a conscientious one, The King's Dilemma. I'm only halfway through this. And the reason is, is because I play this with a group of friends of mine and we can't meet up that often. And then lockdown happened. So yeah, it's, it's kind of on hold for a while. I am enjoying this. I wouldn't say it's perfect though. It's got some issues with, it's very fragile based on the group. If you've got a group who's into bribing and doing all that sort of stuff, then you know this will come out well, a bit like Sheriff of Nottingham. But if you've got a dry group that doesn't tend to want to pay bribes to people to do stuff and is kind of playing it by emotions, it tends to be a bit lackluster in some areas. Unfortunately, the people I'm playing this with are a bit like that, but I'm usually the one throwing in bribes and trying to make things a little bit more interesting and it's coming off better as a result, but I kind of like, come on, you gotta get more interested in this whole negotiation part of it. But the story that's being told is quite cool and I like how there are different paths and all these like different decisions that you are arguing with each other for based on what house you are. So it's very Game of Thrones intrigue-like. And being a legacy game, you go through, you put stickers on stuff, and the path, the path of the story changes. It's a bit unclear as to how you're supposed to achieve some of your goals, though, but then I suppose they'll come up as story cards later. 
But no, 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 we are enjoying this one. But uh, this is one that I'll kind of go, okay, I've played it and then I'm kind of done. Obviously it's Legacy, so I won't be able to play it again anyway. But if somebody came up to me with a second copy of this, I'd be like, nah, I'm good, I'm good. But I'm enjoying it so far, but it's basically on the shelf as a temporary basis. Potion Explosion! Video game in a box. I mean, Call Me are not slash horrible games, but pretty much horrible games. And this is essentially the Candy Crush style thing in a board game. You've got the dispenser with... In fact, I wasn't... Mm, to be fair... Uh, let's uh, be fair. Let's be fair. Uh, King Star Lever doesn't really have a lot on the back of the box. Uh, Pulsar 2849, nope. Oh, there you go. Look at that. So, you know, it looks very colourful, even though it is very dry on the board, but it's a bit of a table hog, and it's less complicated than it looks, but it is very colourful and striking. So we have Potion Explosion, and you have got that whopping great big, whoop, wrong way around, as always, the big dispenser. Yes, it's that whole thing of take a marble out, see if two colours are the same match. If so, you take all of those out, and it causes chain reactions, and all you're doing is basically filling up these potions have different marble requirements. So you need two blue, one yellow and a black to complete this potion. When you do, get your points as well as the ability to drink said potion to get you some cool special power. That's pretty much it. It's simple enough in concept. The only thing is, it is kind of fighting for the collection at the moment because the problem I'm having with this is A, there's an app for it which is actually I think better, but also this one has the problem of generating a lot of analysis paralysis in people who can't accept that this is a simple, you know, fairly light game. You get the people who take it too seriously and they're overthinking their turn, like, oh, I could do this, but then I'll do that and that. Well, maybe we'll take that row, but then that will cause that. Well, what about this marble here? And they're trying to do it for nearly every marble in the Rotten Dispenser. You get those sort of players, this can drag a lot. And so I've been hesitant to pull this out with more than three players, and even then I'm kind of thinking this is better as a two player, and then at that point I can't get it played, so I'm more thinking, well, I'd rather play it on the app, a solo mode, and even then I'm not that good at the game against the AI, so it's it's fighting for position, but because it's just so recognisable by people, and the fact that I do still enjoy the game itself, I kind of hung on to it for now, but this is definitely the kind of, hmm, you know, not entirely sure. It's kind of a bit like that King's Dilemma and this one could be out of the collection by the next time. However, this is sticking around. A nice, uh, whoop, nice little entry. A Dragon Castle. Finally I uh, got a chance to play this. I mean, if I was, to, well actually I might be doing a list, top 10 list actually, on top 10 games I, uh, was it, that got away from me. So games I really want to try but I just never had the chance to. Well this was one of them until I came across a decently priced one, uh, a Brennan Bison at GridCon and Dragon Castle is this kind of very Mayong-esque abstract tile game where you're drafting tiles off this massive like uh, construction in the middle of the table, placing them on your board in order to put them in sets, flip them over, put uh, little towers on top. The You've got dragon powers for end game scoring, you've got spirit powers for cool funky abilities, and there's restrictions on what you can take and what you can't take. It's pretty straightforward and scales pretty well from the two to four player count, although Maybe I'd prefer it slightly as a two to three player game because of the time it takes, but four still works fine. I mean, you're not overly... I mean, I find that people don't care too much about what's on other people's uh, play areas because you've got a chance to go, well, I'll take... I can't really... I don't want to take that to stitch you up because it's not really helping me either. You're more playing your own game, but of course you might be able to think, well, hang on, if I take that, then they won't be able to take two of those so I better make certain I don't remove that one from there and it's you've got a little bit to think about but it's all in all very straightforward very easy rules looks very striking on the table with all these very chunky big like uh, you know my own pieces and the amount of people who keep telling me it's a my own game it's like look it's not my own okay it is you know and I'm probably butchering the name there but it's a different game in its own right and you know very well produced, very simple, 45 minutes or so a game, it's pretty cool. I'm glad I finally got a chance to play this one. And actually, funny enough, a game by Lorenzo Silva. Ah, interesting, I did not know that. It's the same game by Lorenzo Silva, also did Potion Explosion. Interesting. Oh well, yeah, that's cool to know. But yeah, it's a cool abstract game if you like it and you want something that can cater for more than just two players though, give this one a look. Right, that's four more. Where are we going to next? We're going on to shelf 33, and that's gonna be, ah, yes, we're gonna move on to uh, Red Raven games. 
Then we're going to move on to a little bit of Madigo, and then we're going to get on to some Stonemaier fun. And I bet some of you out there who were wondering why a lot of Stonemaier games didn't make my overrated games list will probably be interested to know why these ones are in my collection. But granted, one nearly made the list, Tapestry, but uh, you know, these ones I still really enjoy. And then all sorts of cool games after that. So I'll see you on the next episode. Take care. I'm going to cool off. <laughs>